We left off with uh, Romans 12, 21, and we'll begin with 13 after I just recount this one again. It, the summary of all of our practical application that Paul talks about in Romans 12 is, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, how do we do that? And I, I wondered that one time. I had, a, I had an incident years ago where I was writing some articles in the newspaper, some uh, editorials or uh, letters to the editor, and there was a guy responding to me. And at one point, he really started accusing me and said I was the bigger, biggest distorter of truth and a false prophet, and I was getting all kinds of accusations. And, you know, and I didn't want to make this a public thing where you're doing your fighting in the newspaper. That just, you know, it just gets kind of ridiculous, like people do on the Internet now and Facebook or whatever. But anyway, uh, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So I thought, well, how can I overcome? I feel like this is kind of an evil, so how can I overcome evil with good? So I remember the guy, I knew his behavior a little bit, and he always went to this certain place for breakfast, and he got there pretty early. So I remember going there really early one day, and I went up to the waitress, and I said, when this guy comes in, what I want you to do is uh, I'm going to pay for his breakfast. You just tell him that I paid for his breakfast. you know." And I thought because what was going on with me in the meantime was there was this, just this battle over. I wanted to just tell him, you know, he's wrong, and I wanted to vindicate myself. And instead, when I did that, when I just did good to him instead of just trying to slam him, uh, I left there with such a wonderful, fulfilled feeling. And you know what happened is he, somebody else, you know, kind of stood up for me in the newspaper and wrote an article, said, Ed is really not what you're saying and this kind of thing. And, and all of a sudden, he, in, in his response, he said, well, yeah, Ed's a pretty good guy, but you're... And then he turned on that person, and it was really kind of funny uh, that... <laughs> But anyway, uh, I felt like just the doing what Jesus said here is trying to overcome evil with good really changed not only how I felt inside, but it changed how he felt too uh, toward me and his relationship toward me. So anyway, very practical, but it takes sometimes we've got to think through how we can do that. What are examples of how I can overcome evil with good? Because our natural tendency would be to do what? Our natural tendency was we're going to fight fire with fire. I'm going to... They were evil to me. I'm going to be evil to them. They haven't seen evil till I get done with them. But anyway, that's not what the Bible really tells us to do. So, chapter 13. And chapter 13 addresses giving honor to rulers and authorities that are set in position to avenge evil. And let's look at uh, verse 3. It says, For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of evil, of authority, I mean? You want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. A practical example is you're driving down the road, it's a, it's a 40 mile an hour speed limit and you're doing 55 and there is Mr. Cop standing, he's parked alongside of the road and all of a sudden what do you do? You fear. Why do you fear? Because there's an authority there and you're doing evil. He says, you want to you not fear you know, authority? Don't do evil. And so you know, we can see that a practical setup there. Uh, we're only uh, fearful of authority truly if we're defying that authority. Now, there comes a place where, uh, like the apostles did in the book of Acts, they were doing what God said over again, what some authority said. And, and they're, I don't know if they feared evil, but they or, or feared authority, but they knew that the authorities were going to come against them. And, uh, but that's not what this is really addressing. This is addressing uh, what it says in verse 4 for it is a minister of God to you for good. You know, basically, authorities are set in in position to uh, keep order, civil order, and 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 enforce that which is good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not hear, bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. So he's just talking about authority. Uh, we should we should honor authority for our own conscience' sake. He says there. Um, uh, Verse 5, wherefore it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So two reasons why you obey authority. One, you don't want to come under wrath, and second, you want to have a clear conscience. And that's what he's basically addressing here uh, in chapter 13. In verse 8, he says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Uh, and it, it explains in verse 10, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. So he's saying, you know, if you really want to get uh, do the law you don't have to go through and look at every edict of the law every every statute um, what you can do is you can love he says uh, and owe nothing to anyone except to love uh, one another 
And uh, that's a good practical thing to do too, is not come under debt of anything other than a debt of love to anyone. Love does no wrong, it says, so their love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. The law is what is perfect and right and just, and so if we love, uh, he's just saying, act this out and you will fulfill the law. He goes on kind of a summary of behavioral exhortations here, and then verse 11 he says, And this do, uh, love, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So he's saying, you know, you've had enough time to live your evil life. Now you've been transformed, you've been changed. Let's change that around. This is so much different. This is a far cry from what I've heard some people say of like when they get done with Romans and they say, well, I'm under grace, not the law, and so I can do whatever I want to. This really is not saying that at all. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sexuality, not in strife and jealousy, there's something that happens to us when we encounter the grace of God that actually makes us want to live what Paul's saying here and not according to our own flesh. Remember 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's got to be a change in our mind and, and not only a change in understanding what uh, Christ has done for us, it changes our mind, but then actually receiving that impartation of grace. Paul talks later in, in the book of Titus about grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldliness and makes us want to live righteously in this present age. And so uh, if we've really been touched by the grace of God, and I'll say this probably again, I think I've already said it before in these, in these uh, overviews, is that if we've been touched by the grace of God, really touched by the grace of God, we don't want to sin. And so if somebody says, I can just do whatever I want, and what, what they mean by that is I can go out and sin all I want to, uh, they've, because I'm under grace, they've probably not really been touched by the grace of God. Okay, chapter 14. Chapter 14 is dealing with uh, monitoring our behavior for the sake of our brother in the faith. It's talking about dealing with matters of conscience. And this is, this is really interesting because it's kind of uh, countercultural now. Our culture now would say, take care of yourself. Just make sure you take care of yourself. You, got, you, got, you, can, you really need to take care of yourself. You've got to love yourself and they'll even use scripture. You've got to love yourself first before you can love others. But... Uh, and, and the, the problem I see with that, that, there's a truth of that in some sense, but you know what? All of us love ourselves generally enough uh, in regards to, to matters of this life. Like I've told people before, I love Ed enough that if Ed is hungry, Ed will find Ed something to eat. If Ed is thirsty, Ed will find Ed something to drink. And we love ourselves enough for that. Jesus, at the end of Matthew, he said the, the final judgment will be, I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you did not give me something to drink. We all love ourselves enough to find clothes, food, and drink. And what he's just basically saying, we need to be loving others enough to give them what we would give ourselves because we love ourselves that much. Anyway, uh, he's, he's going on a whole different thing here in chapter 14, a little different thing. He says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, verse 1, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One one man has faith that he may eat all all things, and he who is weak eats vegetables only. Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and let him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. And so uh, what, what he's talking about here is there can be differences in the way we live out our faith, and some people may have a a faith where they feel like they can eat everything. There was a, a, a problem in, in that day of meat that was sacrificed to idols. And many of the churches uh, and the Christians said, don't eat that. But, and uh, Paul didn't seem to have any problem with that unless there was a problem of conscience. It's thinking, well, if somebody says to you, was that sacrifice to idols? You think, oh, well, don't eat it. He said, not for your conscience sake, but for theirs. Don't offend somebody with what you do when it comes to just eating or drinking something you know it's so you know it shouldn't matter uh, to you you should be strong enough in the faith that you don't have to just fulfill all of your own desires you can actually uh, give up sacrifice some things for the sake of your brother especially if it's going to violate his conscience